Lord God, you are so, so good. You sit on your throne and you look at us, Lord, but you're not a God that we can't touch or speak to. You've made a way through Christ Jesus. And through your love and your grace and the mercy you bestowed upon us through Christ Jesus, Lord, we come to you this morning, people gathered here, broken and sick and weak, to hear your word, Lord, that we would find hope in the only thing that can give us hope. So as we read your word, God, would you speak this morning, not through me, I mean use me, but not, not my words, God. Give us hearts and ears to listen, Lord, so attentively to the message you have for us, Lord, as we dig deep. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. My app just went blank. Give me one second. Let me reboot it. All right, let's turn to our Bibles in James chapter 2. We're going to be in the first part of this chapter today, this morning, uh, verses 1 through 13. And before we dive in, I actually want to do a quick recap, especially for those of you who, have, who haven't been with us this summer. I want to go through what we've already talked about. Um, we actually started the series in James chapter 1, verse 1. Sam actually gave us a sermon, uh, kind of giving us a picture and history of who James was, the half-brother of Jesus, and how God used him mightily for his, his church. And, and, you know, birthed out of that, birthed out of his obedience, we have these letters that we're going to be looking through. And then Shannon followed up in verses 2 and 8 the following week uh, with the message that we find joy in the midst of our trials when we seek as God sees, when we seek his wisdom. And, and through this, through this we, we're going to face hardships and trials and have to endure through these things. But it builds our character. And in James chapter 9 uh, through 11, Emily spoke in God's kingdom how it doesn't operate as the world operates. The rich will be humbled and the poor will be lifted up. And whether you're rich or poor, despite your circumstance, we should all take our refuge in Christ and know that he is sufficient for everything. And then in James, 12, uh, James 1, 12 to 17, Sam spoke again with dealing with our trials and our temptations, how to overcome uh, the deadly draw of temptation, right? God, by nature, cannot tempt us. He is completely good, so we are not to blame him, right? And he even expanded on how sin begins in our hearts, in our desires, and that sin, when not checked, right, uh, leads to death. But Jesus has given us new birth and a new hope in the gospel. And then last week, our brother Roman spoke on James boldly and directly teaching us that our faith in Christ Jesus is more than just words. We're not supposed to be only hearers of the word, but doers of God's word how we are supposed to be undefiled and unstained by the world. And now in chapter 2, James addresses favoritism. He exhorts the church on how we're not supposed to be polluted in our way of thinking and treating others. And the way that we view people should not be stained by the world. And it's important for us to dig in because it, it, it piggybacks off of last week's challenge, right? We're not supposed to be undefiled and unstained by the world. And part of that requires us to examine our hearts deeper and really check, you know, how, how are we viewing our neighbors? How are we viewing our brothers and sisters in Christ and those who maybe don't even know Christ? James is going to call us and push us deeper into explaining specifically what faith should look like if we understand this. Um, and as I just want to tell you guys, as, as we dig deep into the rest of James, this is going to be the constant theme, right? James is going to say, hey, this is what's wrong. This is why it's important. This is how you're going to fix it. Okay? And our job as Christians is to be obedient. So let's read this passage, James 2, 1 to 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, 
And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit there in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you sit at my feet, have you not, made, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and ears of the kingdom, which he has to which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name of Jesus? If you really fulfill the law, royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Ethnic background, race, gender, social status, your hair color, your skin color, your economic class. What do all of these have in common? You have no control over it. That's how God made you. Right? It makes up the diversity of every individual human being in this room and in this world. I want to tell you a story real quick. A recent story, actually. On Tuesday, I was watching the Argentina and Nigeria game at work. I grabbed my coffee, and I was just sitting there like this. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm at work, and I'm watching soccer. If you don't know me, I love soccer. I'm a huge soccer fan, and it's, we're in the middle of the World Cup. Now we're in the knockout stages, so it's, it's getting heated. But Argentina and Nigeria were playing a game that was like a must-win for both teams. And I'm sitting there, I'm enjoying it, and by the way, I was going for Nigeria. Nigeria has been one of my teams since qualifying, so I've been watching them throughout qualifying and I've been pulling for them. Um, Argentina, I got to work, Argentina was already winning 1-0. Messi scored a beautiful goal, can't argue with that. Uh, but then, uh, Nigeria uh, was playing well. I was looking at it, I was like, man, they might actually still have a chance. Um, Halftime comes. Halftime's over, halftime starts, and we actually get a penalty kick. Uh, I think it's Mas Mascherano actually fouls one of the Nigerian players, and Victor Moses steps up to the penalty box, and he kicks it in, and it goes in, and it's 1-1, and I jump up. What I didn't realize was, I was so excited in my excitement, I was looking around, I found out there was a coworker right next to me watching the game with me, but he wasn't jumping up like I was. He was like, he was looking at me like, what? What, what are you doing, you know? So I looked over at him. Well, actually, he asked me, he said, why are you excited? Nigeria just scored. And I said, yeah, because I'm pulling for Nigeria. He said, why are you pulling for Nigeria? And I said, because I've been following them through qualifying, and they have a young team. They have the youngest. I was just start naming all these stats, and they have this player, they have Iwobi, and blah, 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 right? We go through all that, and he's still faced like serious. Argentina should win. It was his answer to me. And I said, okay, so why do you think Argentina should win? After talking to him, I realized this guy really wasn't educated in soccer <laughs> and, and hadn't really followed you know, the World Cup, but he had some preconceived notions about what, who should win and how the game should have gone. And so I asked him, uh, so who are you pulling for? He said, well, Argentinas, they got messy, and they're Argentinian. And I said, why do you think, why do you think Nigeria can't, you know, why can't hang with Argentina? And he pretty much inferred, oh, because they're African because they're black. And I was really sad. That was actually on a worship's birthday, and that, I wrestled with that, and I was like, two, two things happened. I was like, actually, you know what, I'm going to use that for the sermon, because that's, that's a perfect example. But I was really torn, because there's this guy, he didn't even realize that he was operating on preference and partiality. He didn't realize the sin he was committing. So in our passage this morning, James explains that this is the opposite of what God's love is, right? It's, it's, it's opposite of the gospel. God operates in love and mercy, and today's message is pretty clear. When we have freedom in Jesus, there is no room for favoritism. 
And what I want to do with you guys this morning is to unpack this wisdom for us. I want to continue spurring us towards looking more like Christ, right, instead of not looking like Christ, to be doers of the word and not hearers of the word only, right? God is calling us to become truly wise and have wholehearted devotion to Jesus. Amen? All right, so would you guys join me in this journey this morning as we unpack this truth? I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to address the sin of partiality, then I'm going to explain why it's so important for us to recognize in our lives and eradicate. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what James tells us to do and how we're supposed to respond. So let's go back to that first verse. He says, my brothers. Oh, side note. Whenever James says my brothers in, in the letters as you guys read through this, he's kind of like saying, hey, I, I love you. And he's giving you a hug. But right after that, he like, bam, Truth right? He's just going to give it to us. So get ready for that. Whenever you hear my brothers, right? Get ready to be like sucker punched with God's gospel, okay? Okay, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit down at my feet. You see, to be very clear, partiality is sin. It's unfair bias in favor of one thing or another person. It especially alludes to favoritism, and, and favoritism is kind of a lighter word, and that's kind of what we use today. So I'm just going to explain favoritism real quick. It's a display of favor, prejudice, bias, inequality, unfairness, discrimination, or preferential treatment to anyone at the expense of someone else. In the Greek word, actually, favoritism means to receive the face of or to receive at face value. There's actually an implied double standard here, a superficial exaltation of man. In other words, we tend to respect men at face value and their appearances. Is that true of you this morning? And quite simply put, again, God hates favoritism. It contradicts the faith we profess. James admonishes us this morning to show no partiality, to show no favoritism. Because the God we serve, right, who is it? It's our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He shows no partiality. And if you want any proof of this, he is consistent throughout scripture. I'm just going to give you a few examples here. Proverbs 28, 21, you can just jot them down. You don't have to turn there. To show partiality is not good. Leviticus 19, 15, you shall do no justice in court, no injustice in court. You shall be partial to the, you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, for the Lord your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords, the great and mighty an awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. And with the Pharisees, uh, they came up to Jesus in Matthew 22, and they say, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by a man's appearances. Right? And Romans 2, 9 to 1, There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, a Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. See, James's text in verse 1 through 4 indicates that unlike Jesus, the Lord of glory, we gravitate, gravitate towards showing people favor based on outward appearances. We make distinctions. We give people our time, our money, our attention, and sometimes our affection based on the preferences that we build up. And we deem them as worthy, even when there's no, there's no point in doing so. Our hearts trend towards showing people favor, who is, and out of that, we assume they might benefit us, right? And in that pursuit, we actually neglect the gospel, right? We, we neglect the poor man who's sitting in our church, who's sitting in our presence. We operate with the worldview of catering to the rich and beautiful while shunning the poor and the common. So from there, let's, let's go and see. We just talked about that sin is partial. Uh, the partiality of uh, sin is, oh, hold on, partiality is sin, sorry, right? 
And now James is going to take us through why. Why, that, why is that important for us as believers? Why should we consider looking at this part of our lives? Okay? Very straightly put, favoritism and partiality is sin. It contradicts the faith and the religion we say we have in Jesus Christ. Right? That religion, going back to chapter 1, Romans message last week, religion, true religion, true faith in Jesus Christ, right, is a facade if we cannot operate without partiality. I mean, if we cannot operate without having partiality in our interactions with others. The next part of James' text gives us several insights, and I want to look at those insights for us this morning. Let's go to verse 4. Let's pick up again at verse 4, actually. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. So sub point one in this, in this section is, in this part of the passage, James explains that we dishonor God when we operate in partiality and favoritism. And he brings up the question, too, that we possibly maybe haven't grasped the gospel or the depth of the gospel. We kind of lie to ourselves here. It reveals the brokenness in our hearts, and instead we've become evil judges of people, right? We're driven by intentions and ulter- ulterior motives. Don't show favoritism when we serve God because he's the God of glory. Christ is the God of glory. And that's not how God operates. All right, we're going to do something fun here. We're going to stretch our legs. Uh, if I talk to you before service, would you come on up? I need some volunteers. And if we don't have enough, I might call some people <laughs> out here. We have enough. Perfect. All right. You guys remember when we used to play uh, soccer or basketball in, in elementary school, and you'd be at recess, and everyone's like, okay, it's time to play. We've got to make some teams, right? You need two teams. All right. So who's going to be the captains? Uh, just real quick, I'm going to pick Charles, and I'm going to pick Sean, because they look the most swole and ready to go. Okay? Let's... Let's, you guys come over here. You're going to pick your teams. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys pick. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, by the way, we're picking for a basketball game. That's why we're... <laughs> Shannon, Shannon. Everyone clap for Shannon. Uh, you guys may sit down. You guys may sit. We're actually not going to play the basketball game. <laughs> so what is this showing us this morning, right? Uh, what's the goal of the game? Any game to win, right? And in this process, while we were picking, I think you guys kind of understood, you kind of related with it, right? Who always gets left behind? <laughs> so actually, several things were going on, right? So, several things were going on. She was the only girl. She was the shortest. And for a basketball game, probably not the most effective, unless all of a sudden she turns into some amazing basketball player that we, did, we never knew about, hidden talents. Uh, but... A lot of times when we're, when we're going through this exercise or we actually do it in the playground, even now as adults when, when, I'm, when I'm playing pickup games, right, uh, we choose those who are the strongest, right, or we perceive as the strongest, right? Um, and those who are perceived as little or weak or unskilled, um, or in this case even because she's a girl maybe, right, uh, we, we don't choose her, right? They're, they're overlooked and not chosen first. 
In fact, she was chosen last, or not even chosen, she just kind of was tagged on, right, at the end. Um, and what, what ends up happening, right, is, is this. We, to win at all costs, we receive the glory and recognition for ourselves, right? That becomes our goal. We, we want to win so that we can just kind of rub it into the other team's face. We want to win so that everyone can see, hey, I'm the most athletic guy in the room, right? There's so many things behind our motives. Uh, to feel accepted and adored by maybe our teammates that we have, if you're playing organized sports, right? Uh, to seek people's approval. And in that process of winning, we neglect people. And don't we do this in the most crafty and cunning ways? Just apply this to work. Are you investing in people like your boss or colleagues who you know you're going to benefit from? Right? Maybe it's for a raise, a promotion, recognition, attention, their attention during meetings. How about your friends? Do you only invite the friends who you know can afford to give you gifts during your birthday parties or you know are just going to be so happy to be there with you? You don't want to invite your friend who's struggling through things because they just, they're a Debbie Downer, right? And how about weddings? I know this is one, right? A lot of us are going through weddings right now, right? You don't want to invite that aunt or uncle who's stingy, right? Oh, uh, Aunt, aunt Clara, I don't know. I'm just coming up with a name, right? Aunt Clara, she, she's going to give me $1. Because back then, it was a lot, right? <laughs> and she still has that mentality today, right? See, James says there's really only one distinction we should consider, and that's between God and man. There's no room for making distinctions between ourselves because of race or skin, color, poor, rich, handsome, ugly, beautiful, or untalented or talented. You know, none of us really have the up on God. There should be no classes or rankings of different human beings. Again, it's God and us. He's perfect. We're sinful and broken. Therefore, we should treat each other the same. And look, church, this morning, I, I really love you, even if I haven't met some of you guys uh, yet. Uh, I love you because this preaching cohort team and the heart behind it, we've gathered, right, together to really dig into God's word here in James um, and share this with you guys for your maturing, to press upon you guys God's word and say, hey, guys, we got to keep growing. We got to keep removing things in our lives that are cluttering our view of people and cluttering our way of seeing uh, how God sees. And I want to address individuals in the room right now also who are hearing this message and you're beginning to uh, just kind of clam up and close up. Stay with me. Keep pushing forward in this message. Listen. Proverbs 17:5 says this, whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. And this brings us to point two, in, in part two, is that when you lose sight of God, when you lose sight of Jesus Christ and how awesome and glorious he is and his gospel message, you start to make distinctions and you start to play favorites. You show partiality. You dishonor God, right? But you also now dishonor people. People, men, and women who, when we read God's word, are what? Created in his image, right? You place yourself on the throne and become a judge, acting like God, but you're judging in hypocrisy. You forget the mercy and the grace that was lavished on you. In fact, James goes on with some searing words. Let's look at verse 6 here. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So here James charges the church. He basically says, hold up, everybody. Aren't the rich ones the ones that treat you badly, who make you feel worthless, yet you still try to win their attention and their affection and their love? And in fact, these people dishonor God. They mock him. They show no regard for Jesus, yet you fear and you respect them? 
Right? Question mark. Why? Why do you seek that? When you know the God of glory. It's kind of like high school. Right? Most of us in this room have been through high school. There might be a few young ones here. Right? Who maybe haven't been through middle school or high school. Um, But in high school, what do we experience? We experience cliques. Groups of people hanging out together. You have the nerds over there, the jocks over here, cheerleaders, the orchestra and band kids, right? And their own section, right? Isn't it true? It's like the plot of every high school movie, right? (laughs) And I want to ask you guys this morning, law, family, are we guilty of this, though, in our church? Because if we're being really honest, I want to say yes. Think for a second about your weekly conversations and your interactions with our brothers and sisters here and those who are not even here today. Think about you and your desire to feel like you fit in, your desire to feel like you're you're making something happen, right? In fact, we say we do all of these things, right, in the name of Jesus. But really we're operating out of motives, We're operating out of evil intention, favoritism, partiality. And in fact, our hearts are polluted, right? And the way we're viewing our family here is still foggy. In fact, in trying to be more like Christ, we become less like him. I want to take you guys through some examples here that could be happening, that could not be happening, but I thought is relevant for any church family, is maybe there's those of you who disdain hanging out with the elderly who are sitting here today. You consider them maybe too old, too removed from your season of life. They can't really relate to you, right? Uh, You don't really want to have any interaction with them. And then there's some of you who act and treat church just like high school, right? You seek out the attention uh, and the affection of the popular kids here on campus, right, like Pastor Sam, right? (laughs) Right? You want to go to lunch with him, you'll take time out of your busy work week and go to a two-hour lunch, sitting and eating whatever, bonbons, whatever you want to do, right? And uh, you're sitting there with him, and you want to make him feel like, hey, you know what, I'm relating, I'm, I'm involved in church, I'm doing Christ, right? But you're just putting up a veneer, you're putting up a facade. Because really, in behind the scenes, you don't want to deal with other people in the church. Let's take it a little further. On Sunday mornings here, um, you disdain serving our children. Right? Your contempt at sacrificing your sleep on Sunday morning or preparing to serve at kids' church or the nursery. It's too beneath you, right? We, we say children maybe don't have the intellectual capacity uh, to dig deep into God's word, so I can't relate with them. I, I really can't have a conversation with them. You, you say that, you might not say that out loud, but you say that in your heart, right? And really, should I dare say this, that there are those of us who, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we're racist. We look at our congregation and, and tend to gravitate towards those who are familiar, who look like us, who speak like us, talk like us, maybe even have the same social status as us, can go to the same restaurants, fill in the blank. When in reality, all of this, all the examples above that I've just mentioned, is it's anti-Jesus. It's against Christ. It's, It's against Christ when we can't spend a moment in genuine conversation with an older brother or sister who just wants to have someone to talk to. It's anti-Jesus when you can't stop to consider the joy of sharing the gospel to a little one. And in fact, I just want to bring up a point here. How many of you guys walked in this morning and you saw Tim and Lucas serving at the front hospitality team? I'm going to say something really crazy right now. Maybe you guys have not even thought about. Those two, when when I was thinking about this and surveying, of all the volunteers who have served in hospitality, have served the most faithfully when they serve on Sunday mornings. 
They serve with smiles. They greet you, even when you don't even give them a look. A lot of adults just go by. I was observing this morning. There's adults, they just go by, oh, hi. And they go straight to the adults, right, who are there. I think Charles was there this morning, right? Charles is handsome, so everyone just kind of gravitates <laughs> towards him, right? Uh, but that's the reality. And then, how did you, and then did you guys see those two serve again earlier when we were taking up offering? They, they faithfully ushered the offering to the back and made sure that it was taken care of. You know, at Loft, these are our kids. We're not here on a fourth Sunday, but on fourth Sunday, our, our youth actually serve us up here on the stage and, and lead us in worship. You can't take a moment to invest in them. It's anti-Jesus. And listen, I want to be really clear. James is not saying that you take your favor, you take your attention, and you take your love and take it off the rich and just put it only on the poor and those who are needy. In fact, he's saying just stop. Stop being partial. Stop showing favor. Stop making distinctions. That's not God's will. Love as God loves. And how does Jesus love? He sits with the tax collector, right? He heals the needy, the blind, the sick. He makes time for the widows and the orphans. Heck, he loves his enemy. He forgave them. And in this passage in James, in fact, the whole letter of James, in fact, the whole Bible, he is continuously inviting us to go deeper into the gospel, deeper into himself, and deeper into the will of God. We're called to bear the image of Christ and to love each other in this lost world. So now what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? You've heard this part of the message, right? You've heard and read this part of James's uh, call, verses 1 through 7. Point number three, he says, be obedient. Just do. Respond with mercy. Respond with grace. Let's look at verse 8 real quick. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. We are to live according to the royal law. And what is this royal law? Jesus taught it in the Gospels. It's to love your neighbor, I mean, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus even adds this later. He says this. He says, there is no commandment greater than this. This is the only one that matters. Everything hinges on this because Christ fulfilled it for us. He came and he loved us despite, despite us, despite being sinners, undeserving of his love. And James calls us to what? Just like Nike, just do it. No ifs, no buts, simply just do it. Just obey God's word. If you say you love God, obey his word and put away all unrighteousness. If you say you love God, persevere through trials and resist temptation. Ask for his wisdom. If you love God, you are to be slow to speak, quick to listen. And now, if you say you love God, you need to love others and make no distinctions. No partiality, no favoritism. Love everyone the same. Treat everyone the same. Treat them as you would want to be treated and fulfill the royal law of Christ. Because what happens when we don't? Well, James gives us that too. Let's look at verse 9 through 11. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. See, we commit sin, and James says we're guilty of the whole law, not just a portion of the law, when we act partial, when we act with favor. A prideful person is hearing this right now and makes reasoning with their disobedience, actually. You say, well, I'm faithful to my wife and kids. I'm faithful in giving and serving in church. I read my Bible. I go to MCG during worship. I raise my hands and my eyes are closed and I'm singing really loud. 
And we go as far as to justify our disobedience in saying, you know what, I've never even killed anyone. And that's wrong. But this is how twisted our hearts are, brothers and sisters. We try to reason ourselves and make sense of this disobedience, right? And here's the reality. If this is you, you have an unrepentant heart, and you could care less about maturing in Christ and really receiving his word and obeying it. You just don't care, and that's, that's really bad news today. And in fact, like last week's passage, it warns us that we actually deceive ourselves. You look into the mirror of God's word, and as soon as you walk out these doors, you walk out the pews, you forget what God has called us to. And instead of obeying God's word, we throw it out the window right away. So again, how are we supposed to respond? In obedience. Look at verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty. Don't just hear and listen to the word of God. Be doers again, right? Obey it. Put words into action. Let the gospel sink into our hearts and actually propel us to love Jesus and to love people the way that God has intended us to. Because when we don't, we sin and we're guilty of it. If freedom from the law came from Christ and we say he is our Lord, the Lord of glory, right? Then we should speak and act as he does. And James concludes with some of the most sobering words. He says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Doesn't this kind of sound familiar? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But interestingly here, Jesus warns, I mean, James warns us, Hey, if you don't show mercy, guess what? You're actually not going to receive mercy. Let that sink in for a second, right? Our God is consistent. If he's shown us mercy and you've received mercy, shouldn't you act as someone who understands that? We know that Jesus said in Matthew 7, Judge not that you will not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, you will be measured. One day you and I are going to stand before God, before his throne, before the seat of judgment. And one of two things is going to happen. You are either going to be judged by what you've done and by how you've treated and loved others. And if we're going to be really honest, all of us, are guilty. And what are we going to ask for? We're going to ask for his mercy. We're going to ask for his grace. Don't judge me based on my actions. Judge me based on Christ. Being obedient to you, God, I've accepted Christ. What that means is this. There's going to be account of everything that's ever been done. Every single thought, every motive, everything laid bare in front of God and in front of everyone. Every sin will be judged. And you know, I'm going to say, Lord, have mercy on me. Please, don't judge me by what I've done. And you know, God's going to say this. If you are faithful and you actually receive this, God is going to say this. He says, you're pardoned. You knew me, son. You knew me, daughter. You understand the gospel. You understand my mercy and grace. Law family, if you have a faith that is not attributed by mercy, you have no real faith. People who understand God's mercy show mercy to others. That's plain and simple here. And I want to remind you that when you don't, it reveals that your disobedience to our Lord. To say that you know Jesus is to say that you know God's mercy. To deny someone mercy is to deny, to, to deny Christ. And someone who gets this is not looking around to benefit and take advantage of others. 
And finally, can I leave you with one last thought this morning? One more question. Do you understand God's mercy? Are you acting as someone who shows no partiality, who shows no favor, who actually loves and and wants to give instead of taking advantage of others, whether they deserve it or they don't deserve it? I mentioned in the beginning that when we have freedom in Jesus, right, the freedom that we just talked about, the free gift of salvation, when we didn't deserve it, there's no room for favoritism. Let's not be calloused in hearing these warnings from James, too. You're going to hear more. This is just the beginning. Let's be sensitive to this truth. Let mercy triumph over judgment. With the same love that Christ loves, let his mercy and grace rule over and win over our judgments and our biases and our discriminations, our distinctions. Let's not have a fake faith. In fact, when you love as people who understand God's mercy, it's amazing this is what will happen. It's going to fuel you and give you a desire to serve the babies and children here at Loft, even when you have no interest and even when they have nothing to offer back to you. Like, what are children going to give you, right? They don't, they don't have jobs, right? They're not going to give you money. They're not going to give you gifts, right? So you're going to just, you're going to love them. By God's grace, you're going to have loving conversations with that elderly brother or sister that I mentioned in the beginning. Even though they can't remember your name, (laughs) they can't remember where you're from or what you do, you're going to have patience, the patience of Christ, to continue engaging with them, to continue engaging in conversations and love them. And by the power of the gospel, really how glorious will this be, right? Right? The contempt that you have towards your brothers and sisters of different color and different ethnicities or because of their station. You're instead, you're going to burn with a contempt against the evil of partiality and favoritism. When you remember that God was merciful to you when you didn't deserve it, you will offer that same mercy and love to those who don't deserve it. Are people going to come to Loft and are they going to see Jesus? I hope so. Because that's going to be the most precious thing in the world, right? To come and see people who are just so sold out, so obedient to Jesus in every aspect of our lives, through trials, through temptation. In our love towards each other, the way we treat each other, everything, every aspect, come under the Lordship of Christ. So James is calling us, hey, guess what? There's going to be proof. If you really love Christ, you'll show it. And in fact, if, if you're struggling and you're wrestling with this this morning, can you pray this? Can you pray, Lord, would you help me remove this sin from my heart? Help me not to operate in favoritism. Help me not to operate in partiality. Give me clarity in the gospel. Help me show mercy to others. Help me remember my, where I came from. If you're an unbeliever and you're hearing this and and you feel like God is pulling at your heart this morning, can I be just so bold to tell you, hey, it's so good to be free in Jesus. Come to him. We have a brother and sister in the back who are going to pray with you if you need. We're going to transition into a time of communion this morning. And as I close in prayer and you guys are thinking, would you not so rush to sing the songs that we're about to sing and and really ask yourself this morning, is this me? Am I guilty of this? We all are in some degree. But if if it's big and it's been very clear to you this morning, you got to stop. Would you ask God to humble you and to receive this word and actually put into action beyond sitting here and listening? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. 
for the grace and mercy you bestow upon us through Christ Jesus, Lord. We cannot speak enough of it. That is the only thing we can sit here and stand and, and listen, Lord, and, and realize, man, we are so, so blessed. And once we understand that, God, I pray that our church, every single person in this room, Lord, would ex extend that mercy to others, extend that love, the love of Christ to others, Lord. Whether poor or rich, black, white, it doesn't matter, God. You call us to obedience, and we can do it in the gospel. We can do it in Christ. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you can enable us to be obedient servants to you. Because at the end of the day, Lord, it's all for your glory. Everything. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.